Good morning. Um, the title of my talk is about Hinckley, but I want to cover the, the whole government program uh, as well as Hinckley because I think many of the issues that arise with Hinckley as to, that might derail it apply equally to the other projects. So and I think uh, if Hinckley does collapse for, for, for whatever reason, there will be people that will put forward the argument that it's not a problem, bad technology, let's get rid of it and fast track the other ones. And I think we need to be ready with the arguments for the other stations to say, look, there's just, they're just as problematic as Hinckley. It'll just take us a few more wasted years to get to the point of abandoning things. So the government talks about a 16 gigawatt program of nuclear power plants, and 16 gigawatts is about double what we've got at the present. And that's made up of, of three, uh, three different consortia. One consortium is the EDF consortium that wants to build Hinkley, also wants to build uh, at Sizewell, and they want to build two of their European pressurized water reactors at each of those sites. Second consortium is Horizon, which is 100% uh, owned by the Japanese reactor vendor Hitachi GE, and they want to build two reactors at each of their sites, two of their advanced boiling water reactors, or ABWRs, at Wilfer and, and Oldbury. Third consortium is uh, New Gen, which is 100% owned by Toshiba, and they want to build three of their AP1000s at the Moorside site. The new addition to that list was the uh, CGN, China General Nuclear Consortium, that wants to build plants at Bradwell. It hasn't, as far as I know, it hasn't confirmed how many reactors it was bu will build. The assumption is two, but there is no time scale on that, and as I'll argue later on, it's a bit further down the line. If we take the Hinkley costs as a guide for this whole program, it looks like uh, the, the 16 gigawatt program will cost in the order of 125 billion pounds, uh, excluding finance charges, which might add on perhaps a third, the interest during construction. I often think of a paper written by uh, an ex-Treasury economist called David Henderson in the 1970s, which I think he called three public spending disasters we must never repeat. One of them was the advanced gas-cooled reactor program, one was Concord, and I think the third was TSR2, and most of you are probably old enough to remember that like me. And I think we're probably at the point where we're looking at three more public spending disasters. Obviously, the nuclear program, HS2, and probably smart meters. I, I wouldn't trust David Henderson to write the paper, as he's probably about 90 now. He's a mate of Nigel Lawson's, and he's a climate change denier. But So I want to look at... Oh. Ants, sign status, and indoor credibility. <laughs> I want to look at finance, design status, uh, and vendor credibility for the, the, three, uh, the four different consortia. So let's start with, uh, with the, the finance and Hinkley and Sizewell. And I think the first thing to say is that financing Hinkley will stretch EDF to the limit and maybe beyond. So I think there is no possibility of, of Sizewell being built on the time scale that the government is looking at. It's not to say that uh, Sizewell will not come up again as a nuclear site, but I don't see uh, EDF building your EPRs at that site on this time scale. If the plant in France that's being built, the Flamanville plant, is not in commercial operation by the end of 2020, and as I'll tell you later on, there are good reasons to doubt that, there will be, there is a clause in the agreement with EDF, with the British government, that says loan guarantees are off. And if there are no loan guarantees, then Hinkley is finished. Now, whether that means the government will uh, forget that clause or whether it really will kill the project uh, remains to be seen, but if, for example, the reactor vessel at Flamanville is not seen to be strong enough, then 
according to the government, there will be no loan guarantees. And without loan guarantees, no bank will lend money for Hinckley. EDF has to raise its own proportion of the, uh, of the finance for Hinckley, uh, so-called equity, which might be about a third of the cost. So it's looking to raise about four or five billion pounds uh, to finance its share of the Hinckley plant. That equity might come from profits, but it only has profits of at a maximum of about two billion euros per year, so it, it won't come from those. But it is uh, having a fire sale of uh, what it calls um, non-core assets, and it's selling bonds. The only buyers seem to be the French state itself, which is buying three out of four billion euros of the bonds, uh, and the only sale it's made of the assets is its share of the French transmission company, which it's sold to a French state bank. So there isn't a lot of interest in, in the equity. And any equity it can raise, it has a much better use for, much more urgent use for, which is life extending the 58 plants that it has in France, which start hitting their 40th birthday, the end of their design life, in large numbers from this year onwards. The French Court of Auditors uh, estimates that the cost of life extending them between now and 2030 will be 100 billion euros. EDF says 50 billion euros. Whichever the figure, that is going to eat up any equity that EDF has. So what about the vendor credibility? Well, it appears that ED, uh, Arriva has been uh, falsifying quality control records for up to 50 years at each of its three plants in France, in particular the Creusot facility, which is the factory in the south of France that made the reactor vessel for Flamanville. That's its biggest, most important factory, and the French regulator says basically it needs to be rebuilt. Uh, the tools at its disposal are not adequate to manufacture such huge components. The safety culture in the plant is not up to it. So that looks like a big obstacle to me. Arriva NP is comprehensively bankrupt. There are plans by the French government to rescue it, but involving EDF buying uh, a majority of the stake. But there are conditions on that rescue, and those conditions cannot be met at the earliest before the middle of next year. So there is that period of uncertainty. And those conditions relate to the completion of the uh, plant under construction at Flamanville uh, and the wider quality control investigation because clearly components have been fitted to reactors that do not have adequate quality control uh, documentation. The regulator is, is probably going to want that equipment to be replaced because you can't have equipment in a nuclear plant that you cannot rely on. The problem is, is the liabilities, uh, and the French government has already signed up to pay the cost overrun at the Olkiluoto plant in Finland. That's going to be about 5 billion euros. But what happens if the three EPRs with bad reactor vessels cannot be operated? Ten years of construction has to be thrown away. Whose fault is that? Arriva. Who is going to pay for it? The French state. What happens if large numbers of components have to be replaced? Whose fault is that? Arriva. Who can pay? It? The French state. Now, everybody assumes that Arriva will be saved because it's uh, owned by the French state and the French state wants nuclear power. But let's just say the liabilities could turn out at 30 billion euros. Is the French state really going to sign up to that? Most people assume they will, maybe they will, but I don't think it's, it's a certainty. What EDF needs is a company that can maintain and service its plant. It doesn't want a company selling a dodgy reactor that will lose its money and will damage its reputation. So even if it takes over a reaver, it might well stop selling new reactors. Uh, the reactor was certified by the British regulator in 2012, but there are no EPRs in service. There are four under construction, one in Finland, one in France, two in China. Uh, they're all horribly late, and they're all way over budget. 
and if the deficiencies with the reactor vessel proved too uh, serious, and the French uh, regulator is talking about providing a verdict on that in September, then 10 years of construction at those sites could have to be written off. What about Moore side? Well, that's owned by Toshiba, and Toshiba Westinghouse is by the standards of EDF a tiny company, and they can't possibly finance Moore side by themselves. Uh, so they will need uh, a big sugar daddy, and that might be a large utility, someone, something comparable to EDF, a wealth fund, a Middle East wealth fund, or perhaps a very large Chinese company. But if we look at those, all the European utilities are getting out of nuclear. The only one left is EDF. Everyone else is getting out as fast as they can. The wealth funds are talked about by the British government, but never by the wealth funds, so I think those can be discounted. <laughs> so that leaves us with the Korean company, which is being talked about, the state-owned... Uh, two minutes, okay. Uh, leaves us with KEPCO and with the Chinese company, State Nuclear Power Technology Company. Uh, if we move on to the credibility of... Westinghouse. It's been cooking the books for five years. It was overstating its pro uh, profits. It's comprehensively bankrupt. Uh, and I think uh, its best hope for survival was KEPCO, but the new Korean president has been elected on a platform of phasing out nuclear. So... As far as the design goes, it has been approved by the safety regulator, but the story with construction is just as bad as the EPR. Uh, the will for Oldbury uh, hasn't gone as badly wrong as the others. Uh, there's quite a complicated story about the technology. It's presented a, as a proven technology, but actually what is proven is a design that was made in the mid-'80s. Uh, which was updated in the 90s but never built and is being updated again. So how far that proves anything is, is, is open to question. I mean, surreal is, a, is an overused and misused word, but we are in a very surreal situation where we're con contemplating uh, the two largest projects ever constructed on British soil, uh, that's Hinckley and Moorside, and we're contemplating uh, buying the equipment from bankrupt and disgraced companies using technologies that have abjectly failed wherever they have been built. None of the three consortia's projects are financeable in their present stage, so I think we're now looking at UK direct government stakes. And I'll grab 20 seconds to just say that the rhetoric for this will be, look, we're going to have to provide loan guarantees anyway, so we're taking all the risks, so we might as well own it. So when they're profitable, we'll make the profits. Now, if you believe that, you believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> New government, uh, there will undoubtedly be, be a question is, why do, you, do I think that the government doesn't give up? And I think the best answer that I can come up with is that it doesn't have an exit strategy. U-turns are politically very damaging, so what we need is a new government which can come in and clear the stables. So I think this is a very good opportunity to uh, change the policy. Thank you.